2018 marked the 150th anniversary of black intellectual and advocate W.E.B. Du Bois. This offered me the opportunity to curate a three-day symposium at the Hall Hebel am Ufer Theatre in Berlin. During German colonialism, the young Du Bois had spent important years of his academic life in Berlin and experienced Germany as a culture in search of a nation. Inspired by Otto von Bismarck's idea of social systems, Max Weber's implementation of social laws, and August Bebel's founding of the Social Democratic Party, Du Bois returned to the United States to include not only German ideas in the U.S. American knowledge system, but to address the relationship between economics and racism and early aspects of social justice. From then on, he campaigned for social rights issues with the aim of establishing a bond between employees and the state and forming a counterforce to the existing hierarchical imbalance of power. W.E.B. Du Bois was certainly one of the most important black thinkers of the 20th century. Without knowing it, he was instrumental in developing a genre that is now known as Afrofuturism. In one of his first science fiction short stories, The Comet, which gave the Berlin Symposium and the accompanying reader its name, Du Bois set the course for a transnational interdisciplinary enterprise. Du Bois wrote The Comet in 1920, when the Western world was trying to recover from the Spanish flu. The pandemic had claimed more deaths than the First and Second World Wars combined, and yet it had failed to crush the racist power structures in the West. This year, Du Bois' speculative short story turns 100 years old. 100 years after the last pandemic, the world is facing a new apocalyptic turnaround. Corona, also known as COVID-19, is keeping the world at bay. Economic health and political systems are being irritated once again as history repeats itself. Where black people stand at the intersections of white supremacist power matrix, the death toll continues to rise in New York, Chicago, Detroit. But what is on the other side of Corona? What will the new normal look like? Will it continue to be determined by racism, sexism, and heteronormativity? Or will we be able to create a world order critical of intersectional power? To answer these questions, I have invited Dr. Ronaldo Anderson, Associate Professor of Communication at Harris Stowe State University in St. Louis, Missouri. Ronaldo is currently the Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, an international network of artists, intellectuals, creatives, and activists whose black speculative works are situated in Afrofuturism 2.0. What is Afrofuturism 2.0? Well, Afrofuturism 2.0 <clears throat> is a manifestation of a body of systematic thought that African Americans were promoting in the 20th century. However, it was primarily an American-centric way of talking about Black speculative thought. Uh, Afrofuturism 2.0 emerges in the context of social media in the middle of the first decade of this century with platforms like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so forth. Uh, also, the recognition of the African diaspora as part of the African Union as the fifth zone and um, other um, phenomenon that begin to take off as the post-Cold War era starts to kick it in. Uh, also triggered by the market collapse of 2008, which was global, and also uh, one of the phenomena that kind of kicked off and recognized was the election of uh, Barack Obama in terms of how many different threads of the diaspora came together and organized to help him get elected. And so that was the recognition uh, when we uh, started this project that this was distinctly different from the way it was talked about in the 90s, where in this century it became much more of a transcontinental, 
Pan-African project. Which relevance does W.E.B. Du Bois have for Afrofuturism 2.0? Du Bois is known uh, most famously, uh, probably about his book, um, The Souls of Black Folk, that he publishes in the first few years of the 20th century, where he talks about the problem of the 20th century was the color line. And now here at the beginning of or early part of the 21st century, the color line is still a problem. However, uh, for the Afrofuturist project, uh, we probably pay more attention to his work that he did in his book, Dark Water, that he publishes in 1920 in the wake of World War I, the Spanish flu pandemic, and um, the Red Summer of 1919 with a lot of racial violence going on. So uh, those two works of Du Bois probably kind of inform where a lot of the praxis and thinking of how his work informs the Afrofuturism, at least in this country. And what does Du Bois um, mean for the Black speculative arts movement? Well, Du Bois, um, as a lot of Du Bois scholars and people are, that are familiar with him, he came up in the 1920s. He wrote, um, I think it was in 25 or in the mid 20s, he wrote, he writes this essay called A Criteria for Negro Art. And he talked about any art that wasn't political that he didn't give a damn about. And in the American context, uh, in recent decades, the thrust was here, at least in the American context, that art should be literally apolitical, you know, that it shouldn't be political. And a lot of the Black speculative arts movement, and, and, and in, especially in the last decade, but more recently with the rise of the, of, of the uh, alt-right here in this country, realized that art has to be political to answer some of these social questions that are going on in the society now. The comment reader with texts and images of the Berlin Symposium also includes a German translation of your Afrofuturist manifesto. What are the leading motives of the manifesto and in which way do they apply to Germany? Hmm. I would say the idea of uh, one of the concepts that was in the manifesto was this idea of the veil that Du Bois talks about, which is a uh, he, he is a metaphysical device, philosophical device that translates the inner life of black people in terms of how they see the world. And so that is, a, there's a direct connection between this concept of the veil and world building in terms of in our own imaginations, how will we might reimagine the world or the society much differently. I think um, how it relates to Germany this motif relates to Germany in a couple of ways. As uh, a lot of people know, Du Bois, his concept of, of black folk from his exposure to German philosophy in the late 19th century, where you know the German word Volk translates into its English term folk, uh, and the idea of the Volk being the foundation for the nation. And so you can see this direct uh, influence of what would have probably been uh, uh, some type of German nationalism. And Du Bois at that stage of his intellectual development realized that there was some, that, the, that, that folk or black folk in America would form the basis of an African-American nationality. And he's talking about how it would be led. Um, the other thing is as far as, um, and then another thing, how it relates to Germany, I've kind of alluded to some of the philosophical influences. I think it kind of also uh, helps Germany look at uh, its own racial problems that sometimes I think it might be blind to. Uh, because uh, as I've discovered from working on Afrofuturism in the Black Speculative Arts Movement, that the Afro-German population is frequently invisible kind of like what uh, Ellison writes about in his book, Invisible Man, they're invisible to their fellow Germans and are treated sometimes as people without history. And actually there's been a long standing presence of people of African descent in Europe going back to the middle ages. 
However, because of some of the actions of the National Socialist Party, you know, of course, the, the Afro-German population's history was decimated to a large extent. And, 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 uh, uh, and at the time, Du Bois is writing in his criteria of Negro art, you have this idea of Rassengene in Germany in the 1920s, uh, the idea of race purity that is taken off because of the perceived um, feeling by some members of the German population that the intermarriage of African soldiers after World War I with German women was some type of humiliation. Bizam is a social movement that is becoming active in different parts of the world. What are you doing in the USA? What in other parts of the world? Well, yeah, that was one of the things that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, when we started BSAM, or the movement goes back to our exhibition that we had started in 2015 called Unveiling Visions, The Alchemy of the Black Imagination, which was largely based on Du Bois' work in Darkwater. That was a network of artists that we had probably 80 artists and writers involved with that project, uh, which was kind of unheard of at the time five years ago. And we pulled that project together literally in uh, 90 days, a project that traditionally would have taken a year or so to put together. But as, as, as I alluded to earlier, because of the uh, uh, the speed that people can communicate and share files with online is so much greater than it was a decade before that show. People realized we could pull together a show around these concepts and thousands of people came to it. I think we also uh, made the determination that we wanted it in a space that the public could come and enjoy the, um, the archive and the, and the art for free. And so that was kind of like the political aspect of it. So we did not want the exhibition to be something that would cater to the avant-garde or the elite, but to the everyday ordinary citizen that is attracted to those type of artifacts and those type of literature and art. And that's what made it a groundbreaking exhibition and probably one of the first major Afrofuturist exhibitions of this of the past decade. Well, the other thing, uh, it, it becomes a movement because really a lot of people had such a great time with Unveiling Visions, they didn't want it to end. You know, we, because the exhibition was up 90 days, and we had artists in the exhibition that were from other countries. And so we said, why don't we take this on the road? You know, as my uh co-curator on the exhibition said, yeah, this is a black speculative arts movie. John Jennings coins that phrase. Because at the same time the exhibition comes out, that's when I write the manifesto. Towards the end of the exhibition, I finished the manifesto and I post it online uh, with the assistance of Florence Okoye, who was also in the Berlin ex uh, exhibition that you hosted around the comet. And the first event we had was in Toronto, Canada, uh, where Quentin Versetti and his friends organized the first BSAM outside of the United States, but it had more of a Caribbean flair to it. Now, what actually kind of made me buy into that concept of going abroad was not so much Du Bois, but Marcus Garvey. You know, as a lot of people that understand history, Garvey was sometimes seen as a nemesis to Du Bois. Uh, while Du Bois might have been the more sophisticated philosophical thinker, Garvey was the greater organizer and I think had a better political vision than Du Bois. And so, uh, so, so you could kind of say BSAM at this point, at that point, it was kind of like a blending of Du Bois and Garveyism in terms of how we were going to extend it uh, internationally. And I remember uh, taking out Marcus Garvey's works. And if you look at where BSAM has been, it's been in places where they used to have Garvey, had Garvey organizations a hundred years ago. How would you describe the German audience in comparison to other countries? Well, it, interestingly enough, I would say Germans have a much deeper appreciation for 
the relationship between art and politics. Um, but I think uh, if you're talking about Afrofuturism, it seems like the go-to person they always like studying is Sun Ra in relation to Afrofuturism. And while we recognize Sun Ra as an important person, the last few years, he's not the focus of what we do, even though we recognize him as an important, important contributor to what Afrofuturism was about. So I would say the German audience, because um, there was a time, and I write about it in the introduction to the first anthology, Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astral Blackness. Germany actually did have a somewhat of an engagement with it back in the 90s, and then it seemed to go away. Um, however, I think in recent years, it's begun to come back. Uh, uh, I'd like to think I was a part of that because I remember the year would have been, was it 2014? I think when I went to Bayreuth, uh, several years when I visited Germany to make a presentation at Bayreuth on Afrofuturism, the pan, there was a panel on Afrofuturism at an annual Africana Studies conference they have every year in Bayreuth. And I remember when we had the uh, presentation, the room was standing room only. In there, so so a lot of people were um, ready for the um, return of the concept in Germany. I remember uh, Peggy was there. I can't think of Peggy's last name. Pizza, Peggy Pizza Peggy was there. I remember seeing her there, uh, and I was there with Eric Steinskog, uh, who's a professor at Copenhagen. And I was there with a couple other uh, young people. They were doctoral students at the time who were presenting their work. And some of those pieces ultimately began, got published in the follow-up volume to 2.0, the Black Speculative Arts Movement, um, Black Futurity Art Plus Design, which finally got published uh, in the wintertime this past winter. And so that uh, was one of the things that I think helped bring it back to interest in Germany. And I did a public lecture at a public library in Berlin at the time, where I- uh, I remember. <laughs> I gave my opening talk. I, I did it as best as I could in German and went into the topic. And it had a nice turnout. And I met some of the other uh, people. They're interested in the topic of Afrofuturism at the time. And, uh, and since then, I've seen the Germans consistently, every six months or so, seem to do something around the topic of Afrofuturism. In 2019, one year after the symposium, you were invited to publicly comment on an Afrofuturist exhibition here in Berlin that took place without black artists, without black intellectuals, and without black activists. What is your opinion on this? Well, I didn't, uh, uh, to me, it was not an Afrofuturist exhibition. It was a exhibition that purported to be about Afrofuturism and the Black future without Black people. And so uh, to me, the people that organized that event uh, took or appropriated the agency of Black people uh, simply to promote something that they wanted to do and nobody in the Afrofuturist movement took that event seriously at all, other than as a joke, uh, because we know that there are enough competent Afro-Germans in Germany at the time that they could have invited to participate in the event and, and, and have something to say about the event. Uh, none of us knew who these people were, and we even know some of the competent white Europeans who do Afrofuturism and none of them were at that event. So as far as we were concerned, these were some people that probably, you know, like uh, picked up a comic book at a store and said, ooh, let's do Afrofuturism, <laughs> you know? And so it wasn't taken that seriously, but uh, this is not the first time that um, uh, these kinds of forms of cultural appropriation happen. You know, I guess if I want to use the hip hop terminology, uh, uh, I would say they, they tried to vanilla ice Afrofuturism in Germany because Germany has yet to produce an M&M of Afrofuturism. So they had to settle for vanilla ice, 
you know. Uh, Do you think this is something typical for Germany, or have you experienced this form of cultural appropriation in other countries? It seemed to only happen in Germany because even in America with our problems and they do some stuff here, they wouldn't have dared to try to do that without. Um, that's the first time I've ever seen that happen anywhere. In Europe, in North America or any place, that event was the first time any of us had ever seen anything like that. I think the news actually reached you as well in the, in the US, right? There was a newspaper article, an English newspaper article about it too, right? Oh yeah, and so then, uh, and so then, when I saw the article, some of me and my friends got online and decided to talk bad about them for two weeks, you know, intentionally uh, to to make fun of the exhibition on some of the social media platforms that we talk about. And uh, later, that's when one of the local Afro German Afro futurists I can't think of the brother's name right now. Um, Michael Michael Kupas. Adebisi, huh? Yeah, Michael Kripper's Adebisi invited me to participate in with the discussion. And that's what I'm saying. Somebody like Michael Kripper's, who's been familiar with the topic for over 20 years, should have been at a, if they were just doing a minimal level of effort, should have been invited to participate in the event. And to me, that was literally like a slap in the face not to even have him invited as a commentary. And then it, with your own recent work, which I know was covered in the media there uh, with the Howe Theater, and to not even be contacted, it was just, to me, a very insulting. The comment was written during the last global pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu, 100 years ago. In which way can Du Bois' speculative short story be read as a commentary of the current COVID-19 pandemic? Well, just giving a little background, uh, just reminding people, the Spanish flu pandemic did not come from Spain. Uh, it actually came from the United States. American soldiers bought it from their military bases in Kansas and bought it to Europe. And it was called the Spanish flu because the Spanish who had sat out World War I it was all in their newspapers. And so that's why people started calling it the Spanish flu. Um, in relation to the comet and now, uh, I'd say there's an analogy that could use this relationship in the comet about racism, what it says about this white, this white woman who comes from privilege and a black man, man named Jim. And for the sake, let's call the white woman in the comet Amy. <laughs> and the black man in the comet, Jim. Her name's Julia, actually. But I'm calling her Amy so I can link her to Amy of today. <laughs> and so she, in her perspective, thinks she's doing Jim a favor by like, oh, well, you know, I could possibly do something with him, blah, blah, blah. So she, this, this, Seeks th she, in the absence of white male patriarchy, he begins to consider Jim as a human being, okay? But then towards the end of the short story, when it clears that they're not the last two survivors, she returns to being sheltered under white male patriarchy in terms of her behavior, and they go their separate ways. Now today, as you know, recently, I know that went all over the world, you had Amy Cooper, the new Amy, uh, who is a vice president of uh, Franklin Templeton Investments, who's in Central Park, another Black man, well-educated, I believe has an Ivy League degree, requests that she obey the law and leash her dog. And like a lot of white women in America who help uphold racism and white male patriarchy, she responded with a typical white male, white female privilege to basically look at this gentleman as like, how dare you use the law to critique me? The law is for me to subjugate you and threatens to report him to the police and lies that about the there's an African-American man threatening me. So some white man can come and wipe her tears and put her back up on her little pedestal so she can reassume her privilege. You know, but thank God for social media and black Twitter. And now Amy is currently unemployed, okay, for her foolishness. Um, 
And it always, and the, and the comment is a political commentary by Du Bois that said, even in the event of a, of a disaster or a pandemic, racism will not go away. As we can see around the world, people like Boris Johnson, uh, Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, and Donald J. Trump, once they found out that the pandemic disproportionately affected people of color, it all became about, oh, let's reopen the economy because it wasn't seen as affecting white people as much. And so um, Du Bois was right. Even in the face of catastrophe, white people will not give up privilege and racism uh, in terms of how they make their societies work. Can you explain a little bit why um, corona infects or, or affects um, the black population in the United States more than other groups, just to make that well, well, since the United States is ranked 27th in the world in terms of healthcare and education, that should be enough right there. That means literally we're closer to some of the third, what they used to call third world countries in terms of how we do healthcare, because there's no universal healthcare system here. Obamacare was basically a band-aid on a long-standing problem in this country around healthcare. And then a lot of, because of residential segregation where black and brown communities live, they don't necessarily have access to good food all the time. They call them food deserts. So a lot of access to decent food that people in other countries take for granted uh, here you might have to drive some distance. If you live in the city and you don't have a car, you know, you can't even shop and find decent food for your family unless you go miles away to go get it. And so that leads to uh, particularly uh, uh, black working class and underclass blacks to eat cheaper food, uh, which is not necessarily as nourishing and as healthy for you. And so that leads to problems of, of or obesity and high blood pressure uh, that are, are two of the pre-existing conditions that this pandemic attacks. And, that, and also that goes for the indigenous people on reservations. So those are the two main things, lack of access to quality health care and quality food. COVID-19 has shifted time and space. How can black speculative art profit from these shifts? Using the word profit, I guess I'd, I could refer to some of my old stuff with, with, with Mark, what they used to call in Marxism value theory. The black art in this context is also data. And data is the new wealth in the type of capitalism or information capitalism we do know. And so the ability to create content by these creative artistic class, uh, which might be in an antagonistic relationship with uh, the platforms that control the distribution of content, like a Disney, Facebook, Instagram, and so forth. And so I, 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 right now, the moment is ripe for Black creative people and other creative people to look for all their alternatives than these platforms that are controlled by these um, global corporations. Because the new wealth now is data. And so the, the challenge now is for artists and intellectuals is to control your data and treat your data as an intellectual resource uh, in, in relation to value. And that is probably where you got, the tension arises between what artists and digital laborers and content creators, between those things they create and then how they are valued and distributed.